be hard to believe, brothers and sisters, but we are in the final lesson in this series uh, of letters to the churches. Uh, the word of the Lord today, the message to Laodicea. The message to Laodicea. This is found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Revelation 3, 14 to 22, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, as we, we come to the end of these letters and, and we see this very sad church, the church of Laodicea, give us one last time ears to hear, hearts to receive, and the strength to obey your words to the church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 3, beginning with 14. Revelation 3, 14. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says these things. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich and have stored up goods and have need of nothing. Yet do not realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be dressed, that the shame of your nakedness may not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, will I grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. And so we begin our final lesson to the church at Laodicea. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I enjoy, and those of you that know me well know this, is I really like coffee. And, and I'm old enough that a good cup of joe, a good hot cup of joe, especially in the morning, is just okay, right? It, it, in fact, it's pretty fantastic. Um, but also, uh, you know, particularly as over the summer, we've had quite a few patches of really hot weather. A and so iced coffee has also been something pretty fantastic. Um, I asked my daughter who is at Costco uh, to get me some canned coffee, some nice iced coffee that I could have in the refrigerator. Uh, and I didn't really think about it. And when they came home with it, it was... Uh, it was unsweetened. It was just straight black coffee in a can. And I thought, oh, you know, I don't even think I'm going to drink these things. It's a little bitter. That's not very nice. Uh, and especially on those days when the temperature hit the mid 80s, uh, all of a sudden those cans of unsweetened coffee tasted really good because they quenched my overheated body and soul, <laughs> right? But, you know, the one kind of coffee that nobody likes, not even in this greater Seattle area, the land of Starbucks, the land of Seattle's best coffee, uh, probably one of the highest per capita coffee drinking areas in the world. One thing that has never become popular is room temperature coffee or lukewarm coffee. We've read our scripture today, Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 22. And what we are told is that knowing what Jesus is like, what he expects, and how he trains us will help us keep 
his ultimate commandment. So what is Jesus like? What does he expect of us? How will he train us? And what exactly is his ultimate commandment? Jesus describes himself as a representative of the Father. He is a faithful and true witness. Jesus perfectly obeyed his Father's will. He obeyed his will for holiness and also for evangelism or or strong teaching. And his obedience, Jesus knew, would mean suffering. Nevertheless, he willingly did it. You know, we look at examples of this. Consider the 12 disciples. My understanding is that 11 of them were martyred. And the 12th one was John the Revelator, who had a life sentence at uh, what I like to call FDC uh, Patmos, the Federal Detention Center on the uh, prison island of Patmos. Uh, I look to the example of the persecuted church today, and I always, you know, I've thought about this for years, but when I was a prison chaplain, my government actually salaried me to preach the gospel inside the jail. In the persecuted lands, pastors are going to jail for preaching the gospel. And I've said this many times, I truly believe their reward in the kingdom of God will be greater than mine and that when I see them, I will give them the respect they have due for they have earned their good rewards. There is also the suffering that comes with being honest and true. Uh, You know, it's a small example, and I don't even think it's worth bragging about. We just did what we were supposed to. We did the right thing, and uh, the mechanic, uh, we asked how much a certain job would cost, and uh, this mechanic said that uh, it would cost us uh, 500 or so plus sales tax, unless we paid cash. If we paid cash, then uh, we would not have to pay the sales tax. And of course, we understood what that meant. If we paid cash, it was going to be off the books. And so uh, we rejected uh, that offer. And in fact, we never went back to that mechanic because we realized that he was not dealing honestly uh, with his own finances. There are many who suffer family and social rejection uh, And ironically, some of the families might claim to be Christian, but they just don't want people to be crazy about it. (laughs) And it's funny what some people think being crazy about Jesus is. Why, you mean you go to church every single week? Somebody asked me that, and it was like, you know, why why do you have to be so crazy? Why do you have to be so so, uh, hard-nosed and hardcore dedicated about it? And I'm thinking that's so basic, that's so minimal. And yet in their minds, just that alone was was excessive. We are to follow Christ's example. Count the cost, but know it is worth it. Jesus is the ruler of God's creation. He is creation's source, its origin, Recall that Jesus repeatedly claims to be the first and the last. If he is ruler of all creation, we who have free will would be wise to submit to his rulership. Amen. Understanding that Jesus sets our example by his faithful and true witness, what does he expect from us? Jesus wants total commitment from us. The Laodicean church is not hot or cold. It is lukewarm. This means they lack zeal. Therefore, their works are useless. 
They are like fire without heat. Nice to look at, but having no power. It is commonly thought that hot means spiritually zealous and cold means spiritually hostile. But this is not likely. Jesus would not want anyone to be spiritually hostile. You remember he said it's better to be cold. When Jesus says he wishes they were either hot or cold, he is probably being a bit sarcastic. He may be speaking literally of water. There was water near Laodicea that was hot. It was good for soaking in like hot springs. And there was water near the city in another direction that was cold, good for drinking. But the water of Laodicea was literally lukewarm. Drinking the city's water could cause vomiting. Spiritually, then, lukewarmness may suggest those who are warm to Christian spirituality, but who do not truly know Jesus. Many born in America say they are Christians because Christianity is the religion of this country or even of their family, yet they have no personal relationship with Jesus. Still others go to church because they believe little religion gives them life balance, yet they do not. No Jesus. Because they are neither hot nor cold, but are lukewarm, Jesus will spit them out. There are only two choices. Heaven to those who repent and follow. Hell to those who give us intellectual assent. They approve. They condone, they, they applaud, but they never repent and never truly follow. It, it, it's easy to see that lacking total commitment to Jesus is dangerous, but why would any Christian do that anyway? I mean, really, it would just make more sense to either follow him or not. Well, Jesus says the lukewarm usually do not understand their spiritual condition. They think they are wealthy and in need of nothing. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of a woman I read about, and she was called the happy woman. And she had religious pride, but... One day, she was told to repent, and, and her testimony is, in, the, in, that, in, in that word that she received, she realized that she needed to do it. She, she was happy because her life was comfortable, but she realized she didn't have a relationship with God, and so she did repent and, and, and found her peace with God. I think it was Billy Graham who said that if America is not judged by God... He will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus says the Laodiceans are actually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. Remember, they think they are wealthy and in need of nothing. Have you ever tried to pay a bill at a store or a restaurant only to be told your card was rejected? I, I had this recently happened to me and it was a little embarrassing it was over the phone and they said well your your card's been declined and I they tried it twice and they said it was declined again and I said this doesn't make sense I just used this card to buy something else and it took probably 10 minutes and they really figured out what happened was that they were using a nine digit zip code and when they just took off the last four numbers in the dash and just used the five. Then the card went through fine. But, but I had that few moments where I was under that cloud of, you know, are, are you someone with a card that's been rejected? Are you somebody with bad credit? Uh, and, and just the, even the short-term feeling of that wasn't so good. 
you know, because I thought I knew what I was doing, and here they're saying it's no good. And sad to say, there are some in the Christian world that think they know what they're doing, and they don't even know God. Jesus says they are actually wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Um, I, I think a similar feeling is if you go to a party and you're either overdressed or underdressed. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We can, what can we do if we find ourselves drifting towards lukewarmness again that spiritual mirror is so powerful saying lord i I, you know i feel like i know you today but I, i can see that i'm not going in a good direction so what can i do jesus counsels them to buy some items from him gold refined by fire so they can become rich this could represent the purification that trials bring the Christians needed to be ready to obey Christ at the cost of losing their social acceptance. And and if I'm drifting to lukewarmness, there's a probability that I've become intolerant of suffering. And so I need to check myself in that area and say, Lord, gird me so that I can face suffering. White clothes to wear so they can cover their humiliating nakedness. Laodicea was famous for its black wool, yet Jesus tells them to purchase the same type of clothes he wore on the cross. Again, he is calling them to purification, a process that will require sacrifice and suffering. And then he says, salve for their eyes so they can see. Laodicea also produced a special medicinal powder, useful for eye problems. Jesus has already told the church it is blind to its spiritual poverty. The Laodiceans should receive Jesus' warning and thus open their eyes to their need for repentance. Uh, And of course, we need to look at ourselves. Is there a warning Jesus is giving for us, for you, For me, if so, will we open our eyes to our need for repentance? If lukewarmness is so dangerous, how does God help us escape it? Jesus speaks of the love of discipline. He says that because he loves them, he disciplines and rebukes them. Note the contrast between this loving correction and what happens to those who remain in their spiritual darkness. They are spit out, rejected. He asks them to welcome him and his message so the Laodiceans might have loving communication with Jesus. In Eastern cultures, an invitation to dine such as this one was an invitation to intimacy, to deep friendship. Jesus promises special blessings to those who overcome. If we will embrace the call to repentance, if we will flee from the danger of lukewarmness, This is his promise. He says, those who overcome will sit with Jesus at his throne, just as Jesus won the right to sit by his father's throne. Once again, there is the promise that those who are faithful unto death, whether by martyrdom or by natural causes, will rule with Jesus. And so what have we said today and what really have we said over these last eight weeks? First, Jesus is the faithful and true witness of the Father. 
we will faithfully and truly represent Jesus Christ if we will do as he says. Jesus warns against lukewarmness. Following Jesus requires total commitment. Jesus warns that the sin of partial commitment is one we can fall into blindly. Jesus' suffering is the cure for lukewarmness. Jesus says that discipline should not discourage us. And I don't mean the spiritual disciplines that we do. I mean the discipline of the Lord when we've done wrong. When we are under the Lord's discipline, this should not discourage us. Rather, it should encourage us. Our experience of it reminds us that God is a loving parent. Finally, as with all the letters to the seven churches, Jesus tells us to endure to the end. This is the great uh, ask of Jesus. This is what he asks us to do. Endure to the end, or as we have said on several occasions, don't give in. Dig in. Father, in Jesus' name, We have heard the word of the Lord. I pray that you will help us to walk carefully, wisely, lovingly, faithfully, and with all devotion. If we are honest, O God, we have so little to offer you. But God, I pray that as each of us would just right now, at least in the spirit, say, Lord, take the wretchedness of my life. Take my life and exchange my sin and my willfulness with your holiness and your will and your way and your anointing and your power, and help each one of us to walk the straight and narrow way, due north, heading towards the kingdom of God, by the ever true word of God, and by the anointing of your true Holy Spirit. We devote our entire lives 100% to Jesus Christ. We pray these things and we give you thanksgiving for these wonderful messages to the churches in Jesus' name. Amen.